Hello and welcome to HIPAA staff training for 2017. My name is Michael McCoy and I will be your instructor today. The information contained in this video is not legal advice. High Tech Associates is not a law firm. However, do understand that the information provided comes directly from the health and human service agencies that enforce and educate on HIPAA. We also work with the National Institute for Standards and Technology as they provide lots of guidance to the Office for Civil Rights who enforces HIPAA. HIPAA is federal law. It is enforced by the Office for Civil Rights, an agency in the Health and Human Services Department. HIPAA can also be enforced by your state attorney general. HIPAA is all about protecting patient privacy. Use these guidelines to help your practice in that effort. The HIPAA federal law protects PHI, protected health information. This can be an oral, written, or electronic form, and it can relate to both the past, present, or future physical or mental condition of your patient. Protected health information consists of an identifier, HIPAA has 18 of those, combined with any payment, treatment, or health care operations information. Whether it's sensitive protected health information or just a patient's name and diagnosis code, it is all considered to be PHI and protected under the law. Sensitive protected health information is defined as patient protected health information that if breached which means it was either heard or seen by others, could cause the patient financial, reputational, or emotional harm. Sensitive protected health information includes such items as psychotherapy notes, information on mental illness or disabilities, uh, HIV or AIDS testing or treatment, whether that testing resulted in a positive or negative result, all information on child abuse and neglect, and domestic violence is also considered to be sensitive protected health information. The heart of HIPAA is the minimum necessary policy. All covered entities and business associates must make reasonable efforts to use, disclose, and request only the minimum amount of information needed for its medically intended purpose. Here what we're trying to do is reduce the amount of medical information that is transferred from facility to facility so that the patient's privacy rights can be better protected. Today we will be focusing our training on the patient's privacy rights, the breach notification requirements which includes identifying a breach, and the HIPAA security rule. In addition we are also adding section 1557 or the Non-Discrimination in Healthcare Act information as well. The HIPAA privacy rule gives patients seven fundamental rights. They have the right to inspect or get copies of all the records in their designated record set. They have a right to request that you amend any records they feel are inaccurate or incorrect. They have a right to request confidential communications, an accounting of disclosures, and they have the right to request restrictions on who gets their information. They also have the absolute right to restrict information from their health plan if they pay for the services in full. Of course, they have the right to receive your notice of privacy practices and file a privacy security complaint. Patients have a right to access or get copies of all of their medical records. This applies to records that your office created and those that you have in paper or electronic format from other facilities. Your office may require that the patient sign an access request or authorization form, but you must notify patients of this requirement first. Patients have a right to request their records in whatever electronic format your office can produce. Now, most practices will have computers with thumb drives, which means you would have to put a patient's records on a thumb drive upon the request. Now, we could never accept their thumb drive. It poses a great danger to our entire network. So therefore, we must have in place policies and procedures to purchase a thumb drive for the patient and then sell it back to them. We can also charge the cost for transferring those records to that thumb drive. The Office for Civil Rights guidance on a patient's right to access says that a doctor may not impose barriers or unreasonable delays. 
Here are some examples. A patient who wants a copy of his or her medical record mailed to their home address to physically come in and make that request in person and provide proof of identity. That is a burden. The use of the web portal. Although we've spent and invested a lot of money in our portal, we cannot require patients to use it. And to mail the patient an access request. That would cause an unreasonable delay to the covered entity patient because of the time it takes to mail that request and for the request to come back to your office. The HIPAA rules also require that you verify a patient over the phone. You must have reasonable steps to verify that patient. And remember, HIPAA is all about documentation. When you verify the patient's identity over the phone, make sure you document that in that telephone encounter. Where a patient requests copies in electronic format of paper records, if you have a scanner, you have the obligation to convert those records to digital format. Again, your practice can charge for the time it takes for that conversion. Many practices will not email a copy of a patient's medical records. However, the HIPAA guidance clearly states that you must email records upon a patient's request. And again, they can verify who they are over the phone. Now, you must understand that email is considered to be can readily producible by all covered entities. And you must warn the patient that you are sending records through a medium where it could be intercepted or seen by others. So as long as the patient accepts those risks, we have done our responsibility of warning them and we must email those records. Remember again, you must document that you told the patient about the risk and the patient accepted those risks. Patients have an absolute right to direct their patient medical records to another individual. It doesn't matter what those records are going to be used for, that is up to the patient. Do remember, have the patient sign an authorization or access request. A patient right to access also includes a 30-day calendar limit. However, with electronic medical records, many patient requests for records can be filled immediately or very shortly thereafter. The Office for Civil Rights and their access guidance determined that there are three ways that you can charge for medical records. The state allowable fees are no longer allowed if they are more than these three methods would charge. So number one, you have the actual cost. So you have the cost of the paper, the toner, the limited labor that we can charge. Make sure you do not charge for labor that is not allowed under this guidance. So for most practices, that's probably going to be between eight cents and 11 cents per page. But remember, you must have the documentation to back up whatever you're charging. Number two is to make it simple, a flat fee of $6.50. This must include postage. And number three is average cost. And that's where you take your average cost for all of the supplies required and the average time to produce records and combine them. Again, remember that HIPAA requires that you have the proof, the documentation to back up for either method number one, the actual cost, or number three, the average costs. Under HIPAA, there are reviewable grounds for denial of access to a patient to their medical records. And that is typically if it's likely to endanger the life or physical safety of the individual or another person, then you have the right to withhold those medical records. The next patient right is that the patient has a right to request that you amend the record. Now all records once signed are locked and we cannot change or correct the record. We can only add amendments to make the record more accurate or more complete. So a patient, if they feel their record is inaccurate or incomplete, has the absolute right to ask you to make those amendments. This is up to the medical professionals involved. And remember, if we deny a patient's request, we must send them a letter stating the reasons for the denial and give them the opportunity to put in a brief statement of disagreement. 
patients have a right to request confidential communications. If the patient does not want standard documents such as billing statements or appointment reminders going to their home address or home phone, and they give you a reasonable alternative, then HIPAA says we should comply with that request. Remember, it would be a violation of that patient's privacy rights to ask them why are they requesting confidential communications. Patients have a right to find out where you have sent their medical records. It's called a accounting of disclosures and it's for a six year period. The accounting of disclosures does not require you to account for routine disclosures such as for treatment, payment, and healthcare operations. In addition, those disclosures directly to the individual or their personal representative and others types of disclosures do not have to be tracked. Disclosures that must be tracked and reported upon request would include such things as state mandated reporting, disclosures required by law, and any breaches of that patient's information even if they were not considered HIPAA breaches and reportable to the patient. Make sure you include the date of the disclosure, the name of who received it, a brief description of the PHI disclosed, and the purpose of the disclosure. Patients have a right to request restrictions on who gets their medical information. That applies to what we consider to be permitted or customary uses, including payment, treatment, and other healthcare operations information. HIPAA does allow for us to notify family members of an individual's general condition, location, or even their death. However, the patient has a right to request that this information be restricted. It's up to you as a medical professional what is in the patient's best interest. If it's not going to harm the patient, we should honor this request. If it's not in their best interest, we can deny this request. Remember to document. Now, HIPAA does have a request that the patient can make that you must fulfill. And that is, the patient has the absolute right to restrict information to their health plan as long as they have paid you in cash for that service, exam, treatment, whatever service was performed. This does not apply to Medicare and Medicaid, only to private commercial insurance. All patients have a right to receive your notice of privacy practices. They must sign off that they've had that ability. That notice must be updated every three years. Also remember that your notice of privacy practices must be posted in your lobby and on your website. A very important part of the notice of privacy practices is that it states that a patient has a right to file a privacy complaint. Make sure that if a patient does have a complaint that they feel they need to make, that we take it seriously and that we put them through a process, that we document their complaint and that we get it to our HIPAA compliance officer as quickly as possible. That way we can help the patient resolve the matter directly with their office without having to go to the Office for Civil Rights go to their web portal and file a complaint there. Once that complaint is filed, we will be receiving a call or a notice from the Office for Civil Rights to determine exactly how to resolve this matter. HIPAA requires that the notice of privacy practices be distributed at the first encounter with your patient. If it is impossible to do so uh, because of an emergency, then at the first available time. Remember, Every three years, patients must re-sign that they've had a chance to review your Notice of Privacy Practices. There are only three ways that we are permitted under HIPAA to disclose patient records. The first is if it's required, and that means to the government, HHS, OCR, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, any HHS agency has an absolute right to get medical records from your office. However, remember, the government does not include law enforcement. Should law enforcement come in and request a patient's records, usually they must have an authorization form. If there is an emergency, review the guidance that the Office for Civil Rights put out on talking with law enforcement. 
The next type is if it's authorized. Patients can authorize their patient records to go wherever they want. And it is not subject to the minimum necessary. So patients have a right to authorize their records to whomever and with whatever records they would like to disclose. Then the last type is the most common, are permitted disclosures. These are the uses and disclosures between covered entities or maybe between our business associates who help us in maintaining good patient care. So uh, permitted disclosures, authorized disclosures, and required disclosures are the three ways we can release medical records. When releasing records via an authorization, make sure all nine required elements are on the authorization. If they are not, make sure to use an authorization form that does have those elements and do not release them until you have a signed authorization form with all nine elements. Requests from the courts usually come in three ways. A subpoena with an authorization. Again, make sure the authorization has all nine of the required elements. If not, even with a valid subpoena, you cannot release those records. When the request comes from the opposing attorney, it will usually have a notice of production. That means that the patient has been given a notice that their records were going to be requested. The attorney has waited the required number of days before submitting the request to you. And now a subpoena with a notice of production, some call it the HIPAA release, is valid for you to release records. The other way is if it's a court order. If the official document is signed by a judge, then strictly follow the instructions per that order. Communicating with family, friends, and others involved in the patient's care. The Office for Civil Rights says it is a HIPAA myth that you are not allowed to discuss any patient information with patients, family, and friends. In fact, you are allowed to discuss limited information with family and friends and others involved in the patient's care or payment for care. You should always ask the patient for permission first, or at least give them an opportunity to object. At times, you will use your professional judgment to determine when to discuss patient information with family and friends. This is not a free-for-all to discuss all the patient's information. In most of the cases, you may only discuss the information that the person involved needs to know about in the care or payment for that patient's care. The Office for Civil Rights put out these examples in their recent guidance on communicating with family and friends. An emergency room doctor may discuss the patient's treatment in front of your friend when you ask that your friend come into the treatment room. The hospital can discuss your bill with your daughter who is with you at the hospital and has questions about the charges. Your doctor may walk to your sister who is driving you home from the hospital about keeping your foot raised during the ride home. The doctor or medical professional may discuss the drugs you need to take with your health aide who has come with you to your appointment. And your nurse may tell you that she's going to tell your brother how you are doing and then she discusses the health status with your brother if you did not say she should not. But remember, you may not discuss a patient's health information if the patient has told you that you are not allowed. HIPAA does allow for healthcare professionals to share health information with a patient's loved one in emergency or dangerous situations. So you can share protected health information with family and close friends if you determine that is in the best interest of the patient and the patient is incapacitated or unconscious and unable to give their permission. Again, you can only discuss what is relevant to their care or payment for care. The Office for Civil Rights gives this example. As a provider, you can use your professional judgment to talk to the parents of someone incapacitated by an opioid overdose about the overdose 
and related medical information, but generally could not share medical information unrelated to the overdose without permission. Remember that the decision making when the patient does not have the capacity to give permission to discuss information with family and friends may be only temporary or situational. Remember that once the patient regains capacity to make their own healthcare decisions, the provider must offer the patient the opportunity to agree or object before additional sharing of health information. HIPAA also has a provision to allow you to use your professional judgment as a healthcare provider to prevent or lessen a serious and imminent threat to a patient's health and safety. Again, the Office for Civil Rights gives the following example. A doctor whose patient has overdosed on opioids is presumed to have complied with HIPAA if the doctor informs family, friends, or caregivers of the opioid abuse after determining, based on the facts and circumstances, that the patient poses a serious and imminent threat to his or her health through continued opioid abuse upon discharge, period. I know it's confusing, so please review the Office for Civil Rights guidance on discussing patient information with family and friends. Now we're going to turn our focus of attention to a breach. And in 2013, the omnibus rule changed the definition of a breach. There used to be a harm standard that had to be met. That is now gone. Currently, a breach is an impermissible use or disclosure under the privacy rule that compromises the security or privacy of the protected health information. An impermissible use or disclosure of that protected health information is presumed unless by doing a security breach risk assessment we can determine that there is a low probability that the health information has been compromised. That changes things dramatically. No risk of harm to be applied. If the information was compromised, we have a breach unless it meets one of the exceptions we will go through. So what are some of the most common types of breaches that you will encounter in your office? Well, probably the most common would be that misdirected fax, where we picked out the wrong physician's fax number and faxed it to the wrong place. In that case, we now have a breach of that patient's information. Other examples are inappropriate access. If we violate the minimum necessary standard, we could be dealing with a breach. And also remember, if a patient gets the wrong patient information, that qualifies as a breach as well. Whether we have a suspected breach or an actual breach, a breach risk assessment must be performed to determine if there is a low probability that the patient information was actually breached. So there are four questions that are critical to our process. Number one, what was the PHI or patient information that was involved? Protected health information is the combination of an identifier matched with payment or treatment information. Document both. Number two, who are the person or persons that may have acquired that information from the breach? And list them here. If it was another doctor's office, we'll list that person uh, who called us and informed us and the office name. If it was a patient, we'll list the patient name. Number three, was it actually viewed or acquired? And here, most likely, you will determine that yes, it was. That's how you knew to fill out this form. However, in not all cases will you know that the information was actually seen and it may take some investigation to determine that. Number four, how have you mitigated the risk to that patient whose information has been breached. Well, if we faxed it to the wrong physician's office, they're another HIPAA covered entity. We could ask them to shred that for us and then get it to the correct doctor. If it goes to the patient, we want to make all reasonable efforts 
to recover that document. Once we have filled out the breach risk assessment, it is critical to take it directly to the HIPAA compliance officer. All breaches must be considered to be critical in nature. That means unless you have a patient emergency, it is probably best to fill out your breach risk assessment right away. Otherwise, things happen in every office and you may forget about it if you can't get to it right away. So remember to fo always follow your practices, policies, and procedures, document breaches or suspected breaches, and immediately report them. We're going to take a minute here and move over to Section 1557. Although it's not HIPAA, it is enforced by the Office for Civil Rights. And Section 1557 is a health care anti-discrimination law that protects patients based on their race, color, national origin, age, disability, and sex. Its goal is to expand access to health care. Section 1557 also expands the civil rights law to define sex discrimination to include discrimination on the basis of gender identity. Section 1557 mandates that your office post notice of non-discrimination in a conspicuous place. Also, you must post that you will provide language assistance services in the top 15 non-English languages for your area. It grants individuals a private cause of action. They can sue you if you fail to offer these interpretation services. Section 1557 also prohibits minor children from interpreting for adults, except in short-term emergencies. Adult family and friends can interpret, but the patient must be offered at no charge language interpretation services. Healthcare staff, they must be qualified to help your office interpret for the languages that they can speak. So make sure that they are tested and it is in their job description that they help provide these services. And finally, it requires that you provide those people with limited English proficiency the opportunity to have meaningful access to your office. You must use high quality video or other services to provide interpretations, again, at no charge to the patient. So again, we must provide meaningful access for those with limited English proficiency, those whose first language is not English and they have a difficult time understanding the written or spoken language. Remember that an LEP, limited English proficiency patient, may have a limited ability to read, write, speak, or understand English, but your office must provide meaningful access to your patient care. Language services must be provided at no charge. They must be accurate and timely, and they must protect the privacy and independence of your patient. Now, if you are evaluated on your compliance, they will look at the length and complexity of the communication involved, the context in which the communication was taking place, the prevalence of language in the, of the individual among the communities that you're likely to serve, all of the resources available to your practice, and the cost of those language assistance services to you. The law requires that you provide an interpreter and not rely or require the patient to bring in their own interpreter. And again, you cannot use children, a minor, which is 17 years or younger, except in an emergency when there is no qualified interpreter immediately available. Even if the adult wants the child to interpret, federal law prohibits it. And again, when a patient comes in with another adult to do the interpretation, you must still offer interpretation services to that patient. A qualified interpreter is one that demonstrates that they have the skills to do the translation required. 
They must adhere to ethical principles such as client confidentiality. They must p possess enough skills and proficiency to explain complicated medical terminology as well. Remember, the interpreter should not be someone that takes sides in the exam. Staff members can be interpreters, but they must be qualified, which means again, they must be proficient in speaking and understanding both English and at least one other language, and must have the ability to speak in the specialized vocabulary and terminology needed for medical. They must be effectively, accurately, and impartially able to communicate directly with the individuals. So remember, if we have a staff member who is going to be an interpreter, they must be qualified and we must document that in their job description. Your practice should develop an effective language access plan. And that must include those that will need auxiliary aids to be able to read and understand your forms and other information provided to patients. Section 1557 also has protections against discrimination based on sex and gender identity. Covered entities must provide individuals equal access to health programs and activities without discrimination based on sex. Sex discrimination also includes sex stereotyping. The definition of sex discrimination includes sex discrimination based on gender identity. Your office must take steps to make sure that you do not stereotypically apply notions of masculinity or femininity to your patients. So do not judge patients based on their clothing, hairstyle, activities, voice, mannerisms, or body characteristics. Federal civil rights law now defines gender identity as an individual's internal sense of gender, which may be male, female, neither male nor female, or a combination of both male and female. And it may be different from the individual's sex assigned at birth. Also remember, transgenders also have rights under this civil rights legislation. Section 1557 prohibits discrimination based on an individual's place of origin or their ancestors' place of origin. The final rule incorporates existing federal protections against disability-based discrimination. So follow the Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act and the Americans with Disabilities Act. Your office must take appropriate steps to ensure effective communication for people with disabilities. Section 1557 requires entities to give primary consideration to the person with disabilities choice of auxiliary aid or service. Remember, no matter how small your practice is, you are still required to comply with all sections of Section 1557. Your compliance with Section 1557 is mandatory. It is federal law. And if you are applying for federal financial assistance from HHS, you must find and sign their assurance form to let them know that you are complying with Section 1557. Your office must post a notice regarding their non-discrimination policies and the taglines in the top 15 languages that you provide language assistance services. If you have 15 or more employees in your organization, you must develop a grievance procedure and have a civil rights coordinator to handle any grievances that may be filed. Section 1557 is federal law. It's important that you understand it and review what your practice needs to do to comply. If you have additional questions, Type in to Google search section 1557 and you will find a host of information.
put out by the Health and Human Services slash Office for Civil Rights. Now we focus on the HIPAA security rule. This rule takes on greater importance today than ever because cyber criminals are after your patient records. The security rule dictates the policies and procedures and other security measures that must be in place to help protect your medical records from falling into the wrong hands. These include things such as making sure you have a unique user ID. Complex passwords are extremely important in today's age of brute force attacks and your computers must automatically log off after a period of inactivity. And yes, yearly HIPAA training is a part of the HIPAA security rule. Cyber criminals are making millions of dollars off of medical records. They are in fact the prime target of the cyber criminal. They can be used for medical identity theft, IRS refund fraud, Medicare fraud, credit card fraud, and all kinds of other financial fraud. And because people do not change their social security number or date of birth, this fraud could continue for years. We need to have a culture of compliance in our office because even with the best security, the best firewall, the best antivirus protection, security measures are really about 25% of what we need to do to protect our patient records. 75% is employee behavior and it only takes one click to download malicious software onto your computers. Cybersecurity awareness is important not only at work but also in our home lives. So apply these both at home and at work. First of all, think twice before clicking. 90% of malware requires a human interaction before it can download onto your computer or network. Never disable security controls such as antivirus, firewalls, or other protective measures that IT has put into place. That includes not installing screen savers or other programs without prior approval. And unless you are using your cell phone for work purposes, cell phones should be off the desk. And remember, it is never allowable to take photos with your camera phone in the office. Again, unless you have prior written approval. The HIPAA security rule also requires physical protections of patient information. Charts, forms, faxes, and all other forms containing patient information should be placed face down. If there is information on the back, put a cover sheet over it. When you leave your workstation, press Control L. This will lock your computer and keep others from being able to access patient information. And make sure when you're throwing away paper, if it contains any patient information, it needs to go into the shred bin not into your uh, trash can. And remember, post-it notes often have PHI and should be shredded. Always clear your area before leaving for a break or the end of the day. And never leave your web browser open when it's not in use. Remember, turn it over, turn it on. The HIPAA security rule contains three critical security protections for your practice and to help you protect the privacy of medical records. We consider them to be critical because it's the most common ways that cyber criminals either trick you or get their malicious software onto your network. So the number one thing you can do is use complex passwords and change them every 90 days. Number two, slow down when you're using email. Be aware of the security dangers presented from hyperlinks, and from attachments. Number three, understand that web browsing always contains a danger. Websites can be embedded with malware and all you need to do is go to that website. So therefore make sure you only use your internet browser at work for practice purposes. To help protect your practice against a brute force attack where the cyber criminals go through the most common passwords and if they come upon yours are able then to get into your system. 
So passwords can be difficult to remember. But if you use two rules on all your passwords, you can easily create passwords that you can remember and that are complex. So complex means it's got to be at least eight characters in length, upper and lower case with numbers, and throw in a special symbol. The two rules I use are to capitalize every fourth letter and to replace every E with a question mark. I took my own name here and made an example. Now you wouldn't want to do your own name or your children's name, but if you can remember your first elementary school, apply these two rules, add two numbers to it, you will have a complex password you're not going to forget. Remember to change it every 90 days. A brute force attack goes through thousands of possible password combinations every second. Now, studies show that Americans use 10,000 passwords in total, or at least about 99% of us. In fact, we are so lazy with passwords that almost 5% of us use the password password as our password. Other common passwords, 123456, monkey, let me in, Star Wars is very popular this year. So using a complex password changed every 90 days will make you better protected than about 99% of our population. Another key protection for passwords is not to cross your passwords. Use separate passwords for work and separate passwords for home. This way if a cyber criminal gets one password, they won't have access to both work and home networks. Email awareness is more critical today than ever before. You must double check and make sure that the email that you are receiving is coming from the sender you expect that it's coming from. So one thing is to put the mouse cursor over the return email address and make sure that the little pop-up that comes up that both email addresses match. Also, look very closely. Cyber criminals are targeting healthcare by making it look like it may be coming from your local hospital, but with one letter misspelled. Always check to make sure that if you have an attachment, that you were expecting that attachment. And if there's a hyperlink in the email, do not click on it unless you know for sure that it's coming from the required sender and you were expecting that email. Any suspicions, either check with the sender or delete. Cyber criminals can embed malicious software in a website. Now, all of the big websites do take good care and are constantly monitoring to make sure their site is not embedded with malware. However, it's a cat and mouse game and you always take the chance of going to a website that has been infected. So use your internet email at work and use your internet at work only for work purposes. Otherwise, you greatly raise the risk of getting malware on your systems. Also, make sure that you do not connect your personal device, such as a cell phone, to your computer. If your cell phone has malicious software that's been downloaded onto it, and believe it or not, most do, then it can transfer that malware over to your network. Another part of the HIPAA security rule is the requirement that the HIPAA compliance officer or their designee review all the activity to your patient records. Every day, your electronic medical record system tracks line by line every action you take. So when you go into a patient's chart and view it, that is documented. If you modify it, you add the chief complaint for the day or update the medication list. Again, that is documented in detail. So do understand that if you are in the system at inappropriate hours for your position, or if you are going into more records in a day than you would normally be anticipated to go into, anything that is unusual or suspicious must be investigated by your HIPAA compliance officer. This is an important protection. It is our practice being proactive in looking for cyber criminals that may have accessed our network using your credentials. So always keep your credentials safe and always report any 
unusual activity to your HIPAA compliance officer. Just because you have access doesn't give you the right to access. You must always follow the same rules to view your own records as a patient would. You cannot use the EMR or access to other patient records to look up family or friends medical records. And no snooping. This has become a major problem in healthcare. Looking at the medical records of other staff members is grounds for dismissal. A reminder that keeping PHI or protected health information on cell phones is dangerous. Now, that could include emails that you could access with your device or text messages containing patient information. Remember that the camera can be used for improperly recording, that cell phones are lost and stolen every second. If the cell phone has access to your EHR, we have to take even additional protections to protect the cell phone. So if you are using a cell phone that gets patient information, text message, EHR access, or emails, then make sure that it is properly encrypted. You encrypt a cell phone by adding a PIN number to it, and now the best practices is to use a six-digit PIN or your biometric or your thumbprint. And make sure that once text messages are no longer needed, that they are deleted. Mobile devices are becoming more and more commonplace in healthcare. You must understand though that there must be a mobile device policy and agreement signed if you create, receive, maintain, or transmit patient information using a mobile device. In this case, a mobile device is going to be defined as both a cell phone or a tablet. The mobile device policy and agreement is basically a document to show that you are implementing security measures sufficient to reduce risk to a reasonable and appropriate level. Do this in part by doing the following. Changing the default settings. Things such as disabling connectivity to unsecure Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, cloud storage, or other file networking services. Many times the default is to allow the device to access these unsecure communication devices. Adding antivirus malware to your mobile device. Many common commercial grade programs are available to help you reduce the possibility of infection to your mobile device. If you're using apps or games on your device, you must make sure of what they can and cannot access on the phone. Many of these apps or games can access your entire contents of your phone, which could lead to data exfiltration. Verify that the apps only have the minimum necessary permissions required for you to use them. Other important requirements are requiring your device to automatically lock after a period of inactivity, making sure that you install all security patches and updates, install or enable encryption on your device, and again, only use secure Wi-Fi connections. Those are the connections where you're going to have to input a passcode to connect. Starbucks, McDonald's, at a hotel, those Wi-Fi connections are insecure and cannot be used. When possible, use a secure VPN or virtual private network. Lock your device using at least a six-digit PIN. Four-digit PINs used in the past do not offer the same protection as a six-digit PIN number. Enable wiping of the device after 10 failed password attempts. And ensure remote wipe is enabled and you have the proper access codes to do the remote wipe should the phone become lost or stolen. Never jailbreak your device because that decreases the security on it. And when it's time to update or change your phone, use Secure Delete. For the Apple and Blackberry, it is sufficient to use the factory restore. Android and Windows may not fully destroy all of the files even with the factory restore. 
So you want to make sure that you encrypt any files that are on your device and then use the factory restore. For your practice you should always review adding mobile device management software that would control and have the capability of helping you uh, control all your devices. If you don't know about ransomware or have not been a victim of ransomware, it's only a matter of time before this malicious software gets onto your network. Ransomware has become an epidemic. 4,000 ransomware attacks per day. That's according to the FBI. That's up from only 1,000 attacks per day in 2015. Expect to see these numbers rise. Almost 60% of the victims of ransomware were unable to recover their data. And most ransomware is de delivered through email. The healthcare industry is the number one target for cyber criminals. In fact, as a healthcare practice, you are 4.5 times more likely than other companies to get a ransomware attack. So the precautions you need to help protect your practice from a ransomware attack is to make sure that you never disable your antivirus or anti-malware. And never click on an update link for Adobe Reader, Java, Windows. If you feel there is an update that needs to be applied to your computer, contact your HIPAA compliance officer or IT professional. Never surf the internet at work or use the internet for non-work purposes. And never, ever check your personal email from your office computer. When in doubt, do not click or download any attachment or email link. And again, always think twice before you click. Once ransomware gets onto your computers, you will have a choice. Either pay the ransom, typically between $500 and $5,000, or if you have a good backup, you may spend days redoing your computer systems and getting yourself back up and running off of your backup drives. Over 90% of ransomware attacks come through email. So slow down when you're using email. Double check the return address of the sender. Again, you can put the mouse cursor over the return email address and a little pop-up window will appear. Make sure that those two email addresses match. Double check the return address of the sender. Films at radiologycenter.com is misspelled and would take you to a website that could infect your computer system. And again, do not click or downlink on an attachment unless you were expecting that file. If you have any doubts, call and confirm that this is coming from the known source. After you download a file, you can verify that the downloaded file has the correct extension. So if you think you're downloading a PDF, check to make sure that the extension is .pdf. If it is something else, delete that file immediately and notify IT or your HIPAA compliance officer. Social engineering attacks are very common for ransomware. Cyber criminals like to use fear, urgency, curiosity, and sympathy and to trick you into downloading their attachment or clicking on their link. The word free is something we all like and cyber criminals use that word to entice us to click on their link. Other types of social engineering attacks include clickbait. Here's the video with cute, that cute kitty everybody's talking about. Click here. Or a watering hole attack. Cyber criminals infect sites they know you like to visit. So a good example of this is if you Google your favorite celebrity, there's a good chance that from those search results, there's going to be lots of cyber criminals that have embedded those websites with malware. Social engineering and networking. Cyber criminals, if they know where you work, that you're working at a practice, they may get onto your Facebook or other accounts to find out pertinent information that they can use to try to trick you into clicking on their link. And the U.S. Department of Justice 
FBI Cybercrime Division. This is a common uh, try of the cyber criminal to get you to click on something thinking that it's coming from the government. So again, always be careful, slow down with email, and only click on what you know is safe to click on. Cybersecurity comes down to using good common sense. Always trust that gut feeling. And if it feels good, too good to be true, it probably is. If it feels off, take that intuition that you have and be extra careful. Always stop and think about what is being asked of you. And not all social engineering attacks go through email. Sometimes they call you on your practice phone number. So always think, how did this person get my phone number or my email address? Signs that your network has been infected. Report these immediately to your HIPAA compliance officer, physician, or IT department. If you cannot find your files, if your computer has noticeably slowed down, or all of a sudden you realize that a link or file attachment that you may have opened or a website you visited could have been malicious in nature. If you do suspect that your computer has been infected, immediately power off your computer by pulling the power cable out of the back of the computer. Also, disconnect the network cable from your computer. If you're not sure what a network cable looks like, get again with your HIPAA compliance officer. After you've done those two steps, notify your supervisor immediately, alert all staff members that they should change their passwords immediately, and contact law enforcement. Incidental use and disclosure of PHI within your office. The privacy rule takes into account that not every risk of incidental use or disclosure of protected health information can be eliminated. Use or disclosure that results incident to a proper disclosure either among medical professionals or to other patients is considered to be incidental disclosure as long as your practice has adopted reasonable safeguards including the minimum necessary standard so when you overhear patient information or other patients overhear patient information it is not a breach and does not have to be reported as such when there is sensitive protected health information that needs to be disclosed, we want to make sure that you put in the proper protections for that information. An example would be a 14-year-old girl that is pregnant. That is not something we are going to discuss out in the hallway between staff members. When we do discuss it with the patient, we're going to make sure that we are behind a closed door and that we're speaking in the lowest tone of voice that we can to communicate that information to the patient. Sensitive protected health information is easily defined. Anything that would cause the patient financial, reputational, or emotional embarrassment. So if it's not information you would want others to know, treat it at, for the patient as sensitive protected health information. We still have incidental disclosure as long as we add these additional safeguards. Protecting patient privacy is everyone's responsibility. And what you're protecting from is protecting your patient from harm that a breach could cause, and also maintaining the trust between you and your patients. That is critical for the reputation of your practice. Medicare fraud is a huge problem today. It is defined as knowingly submitting false statements or making misrepresentations to obtain federal health care dollars. It also includes knowingly soliciting, paying for, or accepting remuneration to induce or reward for referrals. And it also maintains that we cannot make prohibited referrals. Medicare abuse is different from Medicare fraud and that it describes practices that either directly or indirectly result in unnecessary costs to the Medicare program. So to avoid 
Medicare abuse, review your practice to make sure that services are medically necessary and that they meet professionally recognized standards and are priced fairly. There are several federal laws that govern Medicare fraud and abuse. They include the False Claims Act, the Anti-Kickback Statute, Physician Self-Referral Law, or otherwise known as the Stark Law, the Social Security Act, and the United States Criminal Code. Be a part of the solution, not part of the problem. If you suspect Medicare fraud or abuse is taking place, take that information directly to your physician or to your office manager or practice manager. They can review the situation, and if a mistake has been made, get it corrected. So, Medicare fraud and abuse, a major problem to which you can help solve. HIPAA audits are now in effect and ongoing. The Office for Civil Rights has announced that they are increasing the auditing of practices. So your practice must be ready to show that you are compliant with the HIPAA rules and regulations through documentation. If it's not documented, it's not done. So make sure that the forms you have for HIPAA compliance are properly filled out when necessary. Also, we want to make sure that we can show that we have a culture of compliance, that security is something built into our practice. So culture of compliance documents, showing audit log reviews, showing sanctions for violations of our privacy or security policies and procedures are required documentation. Again, I can't say it enough. If it's not documented, it's not done. Breach forms, proper authorization forms, all kinds of HIPAA documentation are required to be kept by your practice for a period of six years. Security is always a balance, and your practice is there to provide good quality health care. But at the same time, we must include privacy concerns. That way, patients will feel comfortable with giving us the information our practice needs to properly treat and take care of them. So do understand, good health care, privacy, we want to put that in a balance always err on the side of providing good health care. I want to thank you sincerely for your time and attention today. I do understand you may have questions. Uh, if you have a copy of our HIPAA Essentials booklet, uh, you can get more detailed information there. Always go to your HIPAA compliance officer for more information. And in the next slide, you will have our phone number and contact information to contact us if necessary. This has been a training presentation by Hitech Compliance Associates. My name is Michael McCoy, and you can contact me at 813-892-4411 or email me at mm at hippacompliancekit.com. If you would like copies of our HIPAA Essentials booklet, we sell the hard copy for a dollar per copy, or we'll provide at no charge, we will send you the PDF version for you to print out for you and your staff. Again, thank you for your time and we look forward to talking to you.